Arlene Hurston, and tonight I invite you to meet a man whose road to success was paved with obstacles that he turned into opportunities. In the early 60s, he was broke, living in Europe, a starving artist without enough money to return home to the United States. Today, he's a multi-millionaire who has built an empire with beautiful women by his side and in front of his camera. He's built that empire with hard work, his artistic talent, sheer guts, and lots of controversy. The magazine that was the start of it all is perhaps the most controversial publication of our time. You may not approve or agree with what he does, but you have to agree that he does it well, as evidenced to being here in his magnificent townhouse. I am right now in front of his swimming pool. We are going to be doing an interview with Bob Guccione, who is editor and publisher of Penthouse Magazine in his living room right after these messages, so please stay right there. Person. We're back. We're with Bob Guccione in his townhouse in New York. Again, thank you for being on the show again. I know how busy you are. The pressure is all mine. <laughs> the pressure is... <laughs> oh, come on. You mean the pleasure. No, it is a pleasure. <laughs> okay. Because it's a pleasure for me. But I have to say, and to see your success, to be here in this fabulous house. I mean, there's no doubt that you're a success. But as I kind of mentioned in the introduction, you were starving. It was 20 years ago, maybe, in London, um, that you started Penthouse Magazine in 1965, actually. 65. It's more than 20 years ago. Um, we had mentioned in the other, you were fired from every job that you had before then. Uh, you came to the United States. What gave you the guts to start a magazine like Penthouse? What made you think it would succeed? I was putting out a newspaper in London, which wasn't mine. I was simply an employee. And I became its editor and its managing director. And like all newspaper people, magazine people, one looks at the newsstands. And I always noticed that Playboy was available on every newsstand in London and that it was selling very well. I used to ask, you know, how does this magazine sell? And there was no English counterpart. There was no British magazine that covered the same subject or, or had any flavor of, of the American Playboy. There simply wasn't a men's magazine of that type. And I had the idea tucked away in the back of my head that if I ever do anything on my own, it will be to start a British version of Playboy, because Playboy is so successful in the UK that if one decided to do a UK version using topical uh, British events, British personalities and so on, it would have to do at least as well. So it was a very simple analysis of what was a very big gap in the market. And when uh, this newspaper I worked on folded. Incidentally, it was the only job in my entire life that I wasn't fired from. I was the captain who went down with the ship. Uh, I spent three years after that trying to get money together. I went all over the world, literally to Canada, the United States. I went to Germany. I went to France, all over England, trying to raise money. And thank God, and I knock on wood today, I was unsuccessful. I couldn't find anybody willing to back the idea. So I, I started, as you know, all on credit. Well, when you say thank God, you mean because you never took in a partner? That's right, because I never found it. The best deal I ever got was when a guy said to me, okay, I like the idea, I'll put up 500 pounds and I want 51% of, of the deal, of penthouse. That would have been perhaps the greatest investment any, any individual would ever have made in a lifetime, because 500 pounds was then worth about uh, $1,500, not even $1,200. <sighs> okay, and now Bob Guccione, if I may say, you, you have no partners, so you really don't have to publish any of your financial means, but the magazine earns maybe $20 million a year. You personally are worth, I've heard, over $250 million. Yeah, that's uh, what Forbes says. Yes. That's about Is that right. That's I about guess. right. That's yeah. about Give or take a couple of million. Yeah, I mean, if, I mean it's very difficult to, at, at a certain point, it's very difficult to assess what something is worth. It's worth whatever 
the public would pay for it. If we were to go public, for example, would we be able to raise that kind of money? The answer is yes. With all of the uh, business, I don't think it would be difficult to raise a quarter of a billion. Yeah, but oh, all of this money that you've raised, I mean, all of this money that you've made, it all came from Penthouse. Now, started, I asked you, yes. okay, it all started with Penthouse because there are other business ventures that we're going to talk about. But I asked you this question before and you didn't answer it. And now I'm kind of wondering, what made you have the guts to do it? You show pictures, parts of bodies that we're not used to seeing in a magazine. What gave you the first idea to say, I'm going to bear it all. I'm going to show frontal nudity. I'm going to just show it as it is. I felt it was, a, at the time, I felt it was the right thing to do. We didn't start off uh, with a magazine that was more daring than what was being produced elsewhere in the world. For example, the early issues of Penthouse were very similar in content to the then existing Playboy because it was a whole new field. It wasn't until I really felt my, uh, I got my sea legs that I began to, to look about and, and say, well, this could be better and this could be improved and, and this uh, and consciousness could be raised in that area and so on and so forth. So after a while, I, I determined by myself that it was wrong to publish pictures of girls where, where you didn't see the, the pubis because that is, to me, one of the most beautiful parts of a woman's body. It's as beautiful as her breasts, or as her face, her lips, her eyes, and so on. Every part of the, of the anatomy is, in and of itself, a, a beautiful construction, a work of art. One has to see it that way, and I felt that the world should look at it that way. And so, we did it. We took the step. It was daring at the time, I suppose, but I really wasn't afraid of what I was doing. I thought I was doing the right thing, and I was prepared to defend that position. Yeah, it was daring, still daring, as a matter of fact. It started in England, and you actually were forced to leave England to come to the United States, because I don't think you originally planned ever to come back. When I, first, when I first produced the magazine, I really believed I was producing it for the UK, and that I would spend the rest of my days producing that and perhaps other magazines for Britain, because I had been living there some 13 years. Uh, but when I held the first issue in my hands, when I actually got the first copy that came off the press and felt it and looked at it and flipped through the pages, I said to myself, this is something special. It was like a father holding its, its child for the first time and feeling the warmth in his hands. I knew there was something bigger than England. I knew that I would take this magazine out of England, I'd bring it to the United States. I knew then and there with that first issue that I'd come to America with it and that I would do battle with Playboy and that I would eventually take the market. Today, Penthouse is published in Japan, it's published independent editions, Japanese editions. In Australia, it's published in Spain, in South America. Mexico is due out this year, in France, in England. There are 11 foreign editions of Penthouse wow, okay. all around the world. Started in England. You left, and, and we talked about this in, in a past show, uh, because of uh, part of the reason, I guess, you had problems with Parliament. Uh, they didn't want this magazine published in England. You came to the United States. Now you're having similar problems with the government. Uh, the, the First Amendment issue, the Mies Commission hearings on pornography. Mm -hmm. Why has censorship become such an important issue now, today? I believe that, uh, and this is my, my personal theory, but I believe that the Reagan administration is paying off the fundamentalists who are, to a great extent, responsible for Reagan's re-election. I mean, they contributed heavily toward his re-election. They were unable to deliver the prayer and school issue to the fundamentalists that was defeated by the Supreme Court. They were unable to deliver the abortion issue. But censorship, they could deliver, and they did deliver. This amalgam of the religious right and the Mies Commission, which is, in fact, a government office, uh, is what caused the problem. If you remember, the Mies Commission in and of itself couldn't do very much. It could only make recommendations. But Alan Sears, who was the executive director of the commission, working outside of the commission, because none of the commissioners knew that he was about to write a letter to 7-Eleven and 23 or 22 other uh, retail chains, drug and convenience chains around the United States. None of the commissioners knew about this. They didn't vote on it. It wasn't presented to them. So it was an independent act on his part, working together with the Reverend Donald Wildman. That is a government agent working hand in glove with an outside special interest group 
nothing to do with the government. They together con contrived that letter, and that letter created the problem that okay. now exists. The letter that you're talking about, and uh, we're going to take a break and talk some more about it, but I just want to, to the letter that you're talking about, it was a letter that was going to mention all outlets that that carry what they considered pornographic material. Is that right. correct? Right. And they were going to publish this letter. The letter it was a real threat. But where were they going to publish it? It was a blacklist. An attorney where general's they... blacklist. The actual implied threat of this letter was that if you don't cease selling Penthouse, Playboy, and Forum, and we were named, if you don't cease selling these three magazines, which we regard as pornographic, your name will then be put on an attorney general's blacklist. It was McCarthyism all over again. And of course, that frightened the hell out of these chains. Sure, but if uh, they chains. were on this particular list, what would happen to them? Who knows? Who knows? But who wants to be in a blacklist? It's like the old days in Hollywood when McCarthy said to the studios, if you hire this actor, this writer, this producer, uh, this director, then you're go these guys are blacklisted. If you hire them, then you're going to be out with the government. So the studios capitulated. Everybody caved in, just as 7-Eleven did. The biggest retail chain in the United States with 8,600 stores that had resisted the terrorism of uh, the evangelical marches, all of the preaching over the, t over, over the air, television and radio, the uh, boycotting, the picketing, resisted that for years. All of a sudden they received the Alan Sears letter, the threat of the Attorney General's blacklist, and they cave in and throw okay. us out. We're going to talk about some of the results of that. We have to take a break, and then we're going to talk some more. Uh, we're speaking with Bob Guccione. We're here in his townhouse, so please stay there. We'll be right back after these messages. I'm Arlene Herson, and we're back. We're with Bob Guccione in his townhouse in New York City. Speaking about the censorship issue, which we were talking about before the break, and you mentioned the 7-Eleven stores are no longer carrying Penthouse, Playboy, or Forum. Forum, by the way, is also one of your magazines as right. well. Um, now, a lot of people say that they do not want this in the stores where children can buy it, where families can buy it, and they say that it is pornography. Now, everybody's definition of pornography varies. What's your definition of pornography? Well, firstly, when they say pornography, pornography is a word with no legal content whatsoever. The word is obscenity. And Penthouse, and Playboy for that matter, Forum, have never ever been found obscene in any court of law in the land. So it's, it's just a stupid argument. These magazines are not obscene. Uh, as a matter of fact, at the end of the commission, every one of the commissioners, individually, including Alan Sears, said that they never intended to focus on Penthouse and Playboy, that these magazines represent healthy sexuality. That's what they say after the fact. And in their book, the huge monster book that they put out, they don't mention us at all by name, and yet we are the victims. We were the victims because we were the names. Okay, you're the victims, but there are people also that say that reading magazines like Penthouse and Playboy and Forum make other people make them victims that, that, that they cause sex-related crimes. How do you respond That's to that? That's absolutely untrue. And every single social scientist, everyone who testified before the Mies Commission said precisely the same thing. When the Johnson Commission uh, gave its results to the public, they came to precisely the same conclusion. There is no evidence whatsoever to indicate that there is a relationship between exposure to pornography or even hardcore obscenity and sex-related crimes or antisocial behavior it simply isn't. A nation like Denmark, where they, hasn't had, they haven't had censorship for, or Sweden haven't had censorship for 25 years, everything is available in Sweden, and yet they have the lowest incidence of sex-related crimes, divorce, etc., in the Western world. And in the Western world, the country with the highest incidence of sex-related crimes, uh, broken marriages and, and child molestation, etc., believe it or not, is the white population of South Africa where censorship is absolute. Aha, uh -huh, so you're absolute. saying, okay, so it's healthy to... <laughs> it's healthy not to have censorship. <laughs> it's healthy okay. to have a free flowing attitude toward life, toward sexuality, toward love and romance. It's violence that creates violence. 
Okay. It isn't sex, for heaven's sake. Okay. You know, it's interesting. That there's been a there's been a rivalry between you and uh, Playboy magazine, obviously, for many years. Uh, yet you took out full-page ads and radio advertisements saying, "Buy Playboy." Yes. Why? Because I felt that uh, it was one way to dramatize to the public the seriousness of this cause, the need to resist the fundamentalists, the television evangelists, you know, the, uh, the Mies Commission, to resist that attitude. So I said, and when I said, if you don't like Penas, if Penas is not your cup of tea, go out and buy Playboy. And when Bob Guccione, I finished by saying, when Bob Guccione tells you to buy Playboy magazine, you know it's serious. Now I said that deliberately. And I was sincere, and I, and, I, and I hope if they don't buy me that they do buy Playboy, but they've got to show that, that they, the public, demand the right of free choice. Okay. How has this controversy expect, affected the sales of Penthouse? As a result of losing something between 15 and 20,000 retail outlets, directly as a result of the Alan Sears letter from the Mies Commission, uh, we've lost something close to 400,000 copies a month four to five hundred thousand copies a month and uh, Playboy was even hit harder uh, they've they sell less than we do in the newsstands they sell half of what we do in the newsstands but they uh, lost something like seven or eight hundred thousand copies they lost a lot of subscriptions and so on it's been very very okay. devastating a lot of people out there are not feeling sorry for you <laughs> I have to well say I don't know about that I don't think that the I don't think the public believes any of that for example at the in the heat of the Mies Commission's so-called exposures, uh, the main went to vote on the referendum as to whether or not the obscenity laws should be hardened. The state of Maine, which is the main, which is the state that brought in prohibition, it's one of the most conservative states traditionally, and yet the public voted three to one against. And when every one of these convenience chains polled their own consumers, their own consumers came out overwhelmingly on behalf of the men's magazine saying, look, we don't want to buy it necessarily, but we don't want to see you take it out of the store because that's wrong. That's censorship. Okay, how would you like to see this issue resolved? I'd like to see the uh, retail chains that took the magazines out because they believed that they were performing a public function, because they were neighborhood stores serving the family, should now recognize that they have a more important function uh, to serve the family in a more important way, and that is to preserve the rights of the individuals to have a free choice, not to promote or back censorship in any way. Okay. Um you have in in all of the in, in censorship you, you had mentioned that you have received more libel suits than probably anybody in the world because of the kind of magazine you have because uh, of the investigative reporting that we do which has nothing to do with the sex element of penthouse okay you've never lost one we have never lost a libel suit no. recently though kathy keaton who has been your companion for more than 20 years your partner the president of omni which is one of your publications the vice chairman of penthouse she sued Hustler Magazine and Larry mm -hmm. Flint for two million dollars, a libel suit. Mm -hmm. She won. Why did she sue? Because they continued to libel her. You know, Flint started a, a, an assault against me and, and uh, Kathy in the beginning, and that lasted for something like nine years. And we got fed up after a while. He was trying to draw us into some kind of a public battle to help his sales, and we refused to be drawn into it. So eventually it became too much. When he started attacking Kathy, I sued him, and Kathy sued him. You know, that, that's interesting. Uh, the Penthouse publisher and uh, the vice chairman of Penthouse sued Hustler Magazine, and you won. Because, right. uh, because we're we were right. Because you were right. Okay, <laughs> we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk some more. I'm speaking with Bob, Bob Guccione. We're here in his townhouse. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay right there. I'm Arlene Herson. We're with Bob Guccione in his townhouse in New York. We're talking about uh, the trials and tribulations of Penthouse magazine, uh, of uh, n not just Penthouse, you have an empire here. You are worth, as we had mentioned earlier, over $250 million. Um, Penthouse is not the only publication. You also have a forum, uh, variations, the girls of Penthouse, which is um, a special Mm -hmm. issue that you put up penthouse letters look it all four-wheeler 
which okay. is an automotive well, magazine. But, um, but that's a different kind of yeah. magazine, an Omni, a different, but you've got a lot that Also deal. defense and technology, we okay. produce a magazine for. <laughs> True. Okay, there are other parts too, but yes. there's a lot to do with sex, with people's sexual problems, you know, how they, you, you show pictures of women in sexy poses, it's sex, 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 that's really how wonderful. you built your fortune. Okay, it's wonderful. But people have said because of that, you've been called the king of sleaze. Now, how do you react to something like that? Well, I just, I don't react to it really because I think people who say things like that are very stupid, uninformed, very narrow and insular in their, in their way. If they had any kind of education, if they knew anything about the world around them, they wouldn't make statements like that. Yeah. Because there's nothing sleazy about sex. Healthy sex is the most wonderful thing in the world. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for our mothers and fathers appreciating the value of healthy sex. So people who say things like that are just stupid. Okay, good. And there's nothing sleazy about Bob Guccione. Nothing at all. I have to say, and I will say it publicly, I've come to your defense many, many times. Uh, personally, you're entirely different from the image that we see, that the image that most people don't see. Uh, I've heard that, that you're shy, uh, not in business, but personally. Is, is that true? At least it was in the past. Is it now? Yes, I am, I am shy. I'm not terribly social. I don't go to social functions. I almost never leave this house unless it's something very important. The only parties we ever have are for family. We have occasional business dinners and an occasional business party, but that's all. We have no, no other social functions just for the sake of being social. It's not something I enjoy, and Kathy's rather like I am. Okay, there is this fabulous swimming pool here. Um, now everybody has visions of all these naked ladies <laughs> romping around in your pool. Tell, that you know, happen. the only naked person that has ever been in that swimming pool we had, when we were just finishing the house, we had two kids come and plant some trees in the back garden. And as before they left, we hadn't even moved in yet, before they left, they took all their clothes off and dove into the pool. And that's the one and only time, and they had nothing to do with us, just that they planted some trees. The one and okay. only time anyone has ever been nude in, in I my hear pool. you've never been in the pool yourself. I haven't been yet, no. I know it's crazy, but I, I never get a chance. I work 20 hours a day, I work seven days a week, and if I have any free time at all, uh, I, I play video games or I watch television or I draw or I do something, but uh, swimming and working out in my gym are things I just don't get around to doing. Okay, also Bob Guccione doesn't drink, as I hear, is that true? I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't use dope, I don't gamble, I don't go to nightclubs. I'm very unlike the average person perceived me to be because people, Hefner has spent almost his entire public life publicizing himself, what he does, his, his parties and movie stars and all the rest of it. And so people think that I'm the same as he is, but we're totally different people. I'm nothing like he is. Okay, now wait a minute, we only have 30 seconds left, but you say you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't go to parties, you don't go out, you don't entertain very much. What do you do for I fun? I produce sex-related magazines that sell well, <laughs> and I love every minute of it. And you make a lot of money. And I enjoy that part of it, too, I must say. <laughs> okay. And I have enjoyed uh, having you as a guest on my show. Again, I thank you for having us here thank in your house. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed meeting Bob Guccione. I know that I certainly have, and I hope you join us again next week. Meantime, hope to see you then. Good night. Arlene Hurston, and tonight I invite you to meet a man who is definitely a mover and a shaker. He has moved all over the world where he has shaken not only the pub publishing industry, but English Parliament and the Miss America contest. He is a man who seems to enjoy the turbulence. It certainly was not smooth sailing when he created one of the most daring magazines to hit the newsstands, but it made him a multi-millionaire and has enabled him to publish Omni, an award-winning futuristic magazine, produce movies, and finance science projects. He's a man always
always on the move, outspoken, controversial, and very successful, who seems to enjoy shaking up the establishment. He is Bob Guccione, editor and publisher of Penthouse Magazine, and we're going to meet Bob Guccione right after these messages, so please stay right there. I'm Arlene Herson. We're back. We're with Bob Guccione in his townhouse in New York. Thank you for having us here. My pleasure. In this beautiful townhouse. I must say, not bad from a young man from Bergenfield, New Jersey, who uh, graduated from prep school, did not go to college, went to Europe with no money, no prospect for success. You must be very proud of yourself. Um, I feel like I, like I did the right thing. <laughs> Okay, but you know, at that time, I have to say, you are very bright, obviously, by this empire that you have built. But after graduating prep school, you decided to go to Europe. I understand that you had turned down a scholarship to Princeton. Why did you decide? Well, I, I had a number of scholarships. Princeton was one. It was an academic scholarship. And I had a number of ath athletic scholarships as well to other universities. But um, I had a big decision to make. I was very interested in the sciences and in art. So if I decided to pursue a course in science or a life in science, then I was going to go to university. But if on the other hand I decided to paint, I would leave and immediately go to Italy. And that's what I finally opted to do. I went to Italy, set up a studio, and started working on my own. Well, you know, you make it sound so How old were you at the time? I was 18. 18. Now you Just were... turned 19. Okay, but at 18 years old you were married for the first time. Yes, I got married. Why? I did everything very quickly. <laughs> okay, but 18 years old, why did you get married? I was on a collision married? course with life. <laughs> I wanted to see and feel and experience everything as quickly as possible. Okay, but it didn't work. Why did you marry at 18? Uh, I think I thought it was the right thing to do at the time. The lady I was going with uh, seemed to be right at the time. I was very naive, very unsophisticated. Uh, just coming out of an all-boys school, it was a whole new experience. Being that close to a, a lady that I really uh, felt I knew and understood and appreciated. And I just thought it was the right thing to do. And we had a baby, by the way, so I've got a daughter uh, by that first marriage. It lasted, that marriage lasted five years. Okay. And I immediately married my second wife. I've been married almost all my life. You see. <laughs> I married my second wife practically the day that I divorced my first wife and the soon after I uh, split up with my second wife I met Kathy Keaton and I've been with Kathy now for the last 21 years so I've always had a life companion yes but you and Kathy are not married I mean your not first and second marriages you got married that didn't yes. work uh, you and Kathy are together for more than 20 years That's right. why is that working Maybe it's because we didn't get married that it's working. But whatever it is, whatever we struck, it was a very successful chord. And it's something that one hates to tamper with. When it works this well, you don't want to play around with the formula. I agree. We will eventually marry. I think perhaps when uh, we're a little older. We're still <laughs> okay. Young. Well, you're just getting to know each other. So you've only been together 20 years. But you met in Europe, because I want right. to take you back there. Actually, you met Kathy when you were in England, I believe, and she started to work for you as a sales rep I at Penthouse. I met her after I published the first issue, the very first issue of Penthouse, which, which contained a little squib about a film that Kathy had just made. We received a release from Paramount Films, I think it was the spy who came in from the cold, and they had a lot of things to say about Kathy, that she had a private zoo in Mozambique, she was a South African, and she was, of course, then the best known and highest paid dancer. In, in England. Uh, so they made a lot out of her. And we thought it was very funny. And I didn't know Kathy then, and I wasn't familiar with show business, didn't care much about it. So we wrote a humorous thing based on the release that Paramount set out, sent, sent out to the press. And when her manager read it, he called me up and he was violent over the telephone. He said, how dare you say this sort of thing about this absolutely wonderful star? You know, this is a great lady. And, and you uh, shouldn't talk like that unless you see her and meet her. And he invited me to go to one of her shows. And I decided finally that I would go. And that's how I met her. I was very impressed with her. And she was then earning 150 pounds a week in England, as opposed to a secretary that was earning five pounds a week, or me, who had recently worked um, 
for the oldest dry cleaning company in England as their managing director, and I received 20 pounds a week. So it gives you some idea of the proportions. And when I eventually asked Kathy to come and work for, uh, for us, for me, uh, she said, well, okay. She agreed right away, because I said, I want you to come work on the magazine. And I said, well, I, I can't pay you uh, as much as you're making. And she says, well, how much can you pay? I said, 15 pounds a week. And she said, okay. Again, she immediately okayed it. I said, but uh, I can't give you the whole 15 pounds. You'll have to defer five and I'll give you 10 pounds a week, bearing in mind that she was earning 150. So she accepted that. And she worked with me for practically a year before we began to go out socially. So it was a business arrangement to begin with. Uh -huh. Well, a good business arrangement for her because here we are in this fabulous right. house. She made the right choice. She made a good as investment. I did. Okay, yes. but those days back there, because uh, you didn't have any money. Uh, you weren't that good a prospect. You had been fired from every job you ever had. Correct. Um, you know, here you were, starting a magazine. Is showing. it that well known that oh. I was fired from every job I ever had? It's true. <laughs> well, I know it. Yeah. But, you know, here you were, starting a magazine, and it wasn't, you know, a magazine for the first time, showing parts of women that we weren't used to seeing in magazines, complete frontal nudity. Shocking. Shocked Parliament, as a matter of fact. Didn't they try and stop you from publishing? Well, the problem with... Uh, with Parliament began when I first sent out my subscription brochures because I had no money to start the magazine. The magazine was absolutely uh, started on credit, 100% on credit. I didn't have a single penny. I was six months behind in my rent. And uh, I created the idea of sending out up to a million subscriptions. And there never had been a mailing of that size in England. England was very vulnerable, mail order wise. And I had dabbled in mail order after I left this newspaper that I worked for, edited for about a year. And I recognized the potential of that market. I knew that if I put out something very exciting by way of a brochure, inviting people to su subscribe to a brand new men's magazine, which I very carefully designed you know, in my mind and then wrote out on paper, the magazine didn't exist, that I could get, I would get a good response. So I sent this brochure out and it contained eight nudes, which I had photographed myself and no one had ever done this before. And the nudes were not such that uh, I could be attacked under the Obscene Publications Act, but it had created such a furor because the pyramiding effect of my mailings, first I put out 25,000 pieces to a test market to see, you know, I tested 5,000 doctors, but in fact, the brochures only hit 500 doctors, 4,500 schoolboys, old age pensioners, uh, members of parliament, women, vicars, all sorts of other people got this and started screaming. And my, my uh, concept was to get the income from the 25,000 mailing, and then put out a 50,000 mailing based on that, then 100,000 and build it up to a, to a total of a million. But after the first test mailing, questions were raised in Parliament immediately. I eventually went to court and I lost and it cost me $250 fine. That was the limit. And the day I stepped out of court was the day the magazine went on sale. We had programmed it that way, my lawyer and myself. And we sold out the entire first uh, print order, which was 120,000. That's 10,000 copies more than Punch magazine was selling in England. 120,000 copies were entirely sold out in three days. And people began spending, bearing in mind five pounds was what a secretary earned. Right. They were paying five pounds a piece for the first issues of Penthouse okay. three days yeah. later. Oh, all right, so Penthouse immediately was a success in England. Absolutely. I, but the subject matter and the fact that it became so successful and why it became so successful, we have to take a break. We're going to come back and, uh, and talk some more. We're speaking with Bob Guccione. We're in his townhouse in New York. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay right there. I'm Arlene Hurston, and we're back with Bob Guccione. We're here in his townhouse in New York, where you've come a long way from what we were talking about from Europe, getting out that first issue of Penthouse magazine. I mean, it's all history because obviously, you know, you're enormously successful, but that first issue, there were so many problems. How did you get yeah. the first one out? Well, that was the toughest, of course. Uh, during the period that uh, I had been summoned, you see, before I went to court and paid that $250 fine, while I was waiting to be served, because my lawyer said to me, now is not the time to accept summons. 
because if you do, you're going to be tried outside of London by three magistrates, a butcher, uh, the local school teacher, and you have no chance at all. I want you to wait, and then I'll get you into the Well Street Magistrate Court in London proper where you have a much better chance, okay? So I stayed in my house for three days during the preparation of the first issue, and just across the street from this little house in Chelsea, uh, two officers sat 24 hours a day, three shifts of eight hours each, waiting for me to appear in public because as I was not being served under the criminal code, they couldn't come into my house. They had to wait until I came out in public. So every morning, my art director, my one and only employee, would arrive, would put galleys through the letterbox together with cigarettes and chewing gum, sandwiches, and so that's how I ate and lived for those three weeks. And I continued to design the magazine, write it. I did almost everything myself on the first issue. And I would pass corrected galleys and stuff back to him through the letterbox. And that's literally how the first issue got done. Then I, my lawyer called up and said, okay, now it's time to, to, to accept the summons. I opened the door, the cops came over and hit me with it. And uh, a few weeks later, or six weeks later or so, the magazine had gone to print. I went into court, and as I say, I lost. But after I lost, the prosecuting counsel, um, Queen's counsel, came over to me and he said, took his wig off, he stuck his hand and he says, I want to shake your hand. I said, oh? He said, yes. He said, I want to tell you that I agree with everything you do and I, I believe in everything you're doing. He said, I, I want to apologize, but this is my job and I have to do it. But I just want to tell you that I, you know, I, I wish you the best in the world. Shook my hand vigorously and walked away and I stood there with my jaw down to here. Okay, you were fine, but they still didn't prevent you from putting out Penthouse Magazine, which um, is on the newsstands. Everybody can buy it now. You have made Bob Guccione and Penthouse a household word. However, I have to say, a lot of people don't use very nice household words sometimes to describe you and the magazine because of the subject matter. Why did you think? I mean, this is really a um, you know, daring, dynamite, the kind of pictures you took. Why did you do that? Or do take, not just, why did you think that well, would be a success? Perhaps our claim to fame photographically is that we published the first full frontal nudes. Up until the time Penthouse came out, uh, no magazine, including Playboy, which, which, which was then enormously successful. When we came into the American market with Penthouse, Playboy was then selling four and a half million copies. And our first issue, I think, sold 260 or 300,000 copies. Uh, and shortly after that, we began to publish the first, the first pictures showing pubic hair. And that was a no-no. A there was no law against it, but there was a kind of um, thumbnail law which said that the dividing line between acceptable erotic photography and non-acceptable pornographic or obscene photography was the showing of pubic hair. Well, that was something that philosophically I couldn't swallow because why is it that a woman's pubic hair is per se uh, or, or de facto obscene? It didn't make sense to me. In fact, to me, the obscenity was to airbrush the pubis out as if it didn't exist. You know, uh, so I figured that I had a great defense if I published such pictures and I was prepared to take the heat. I was prepared to go to court and make my defense, which was simply that under the Judeo-Christian religion and philosophy, if God created man in his own image, then he didn't take from himself an obscenity and place it there on a woman or a man. So it cannot be the anatomy that is obscene. It must be what you do with it where the obscenity lies. So we took the chance. We published it, and of course, everybody stood still and watched Playboy. We had already described ourselves in the press by taking ads in newspapers all across the country that we were the definitive competitor to Playboy, although we were only selling, as I say, 260, 300,000 copies against four and a half million. But Playboy stopped and waited. They didn't do anything. They just continued, but they watched and said, Guccione's gonna lose the little advertising that he has, he's gonna lose his outlets, and this is gonna drive him out of business. But in fact, it didn't. So it took Playboy about two years before the first glimpse of pubic hair began to show in their pages. But by that very act of waiting to see what would happen to me, the lead passed from Playboy to the little magazine Penthouse. So it was what we were doing at the time that was controversial and innovative, not what Playboy was doing. They were treading water. 
and we were moving ahead. And it's been that way ever since. Well, you know, I, I just can't help but think, and I really, there's so much to talk about, but that first day that you decided, hey, let's do it. You know, what's going to happen? What gave you the first idea to, to be so daring, to kind of have the courage well, as I say, it was to a, break it? It was a tough decision, but I had, I had worked out what I thought was a real defense to it if I had to go to court. And I, I fully expected that I would go to court over this. You know, I'd, I'd get obscene uh, uh, suits, or suits for obscenity from district attorneys all over the country. But in fact, it didn't happen. Nobody bothered us. Okay, but you have had a lot of criticism, a lot of personal criticism. As I had mentioned, uh, you know, you're a household word, and, and people have said a lot of things about you negatively. How do you react to the criticism? Well, firstly, that kind of criticism normally comes from the same quarters. It comes from the religious zealots, like the fundamentalists and the television evangelists, all of whom uh, use, use people like me to pull more money out of their congregation. You know, they say that I'm destroying the family, I'm destroying uh, children, uh, I'm, I'm hurting women, daughters, mothers, wives, and this helps them get more money from the old, lonely people that but watch them. The criticism <clears throat> are n do, does not necessarily only come from that kind of person. It comes from the housewife, the mother that feminists. says, you know, from family, but it also comes from the housewife that says, I don't want my son to see those kind of pictures in, in mm -hmm. his bedroom. And therefore, Bob Guccione is doing a disservice well, you see, if I thought that they were right, if I thought that there was any way that this magazine could be harmful to children, I wouldn't produce it in the way that I do. But I don't agree with that. And no social scientist that I know agrees with that uh, concept that children can be hurt by looking at a magazine like Penthouse. They simply cannot be. The facts are that until a child reaches puberty, he has no hormonal, no chemical, no biological, no mental reaction to nudity unless that reaction is placed there by a parent who says, who snatches a magazine like Penthouse away from a child and says, you shouldn't be looking at that. That immediately creates a sense of shame and guilt with respect to sex. But the child itself reacts totally not at all, except out of curiosity. And when a child hits puberty, there's nothing in Penthouse that can begin to equal what that child can conjure up in the pornographic theater of its own mind. Interesting point. We have to stop here, and then we're going to come back and talk some more. We have to take a break. We're speaking with Bob Guccione. We're in his townhouse in New York. We'll be right back after these messages. I'm Arlene Herson, and my guest is Bob Guccione. We're here in his townhouse. We were talking about some of the criticism. One of the biggest things that you were criticized about was uh, the dethroning of this area. <laughs> okay. Vanessa Williams. Vanessa Williams. As a matter of fact, we have some of the pictures. And while we talk, uh, I'm going to show, well, of course, we can only show a portion of it, but you were criticized greatly for that. Any regrets? None at all. As a matter of fact, as you know, she sued us for $400 million saying she had never signed a model release and we had no authority or any legal right to publish the pictures. About three months ago, because we threatened to sue her lawyers, because her lawyers were bringing, in our uh, opinion, a fallacious lawsuit because we knew we had a signed release. One of the law firms that represented her immediately backed out and the other one threw in a towel and they sent out, they issued a press release saying, apologizing to me, saying that she does agree that it is her signature on the model release, and she does agree that I had every legal right to publish the pictures, and she withdrew her quote-unquote $400 million ridiculous lawsuit. Where she was dishonorable, not us, because it was something was offered to me for sale, and I have to make up my mind, is this of interest to my customers, or isn't it? Of course it was of interest to my customers. But she was under a moral as well as legal obligation to disclose to the pageant people that she had indeed done something in her background which if it surfaced would prove embarrassing to the uh, contest. She did not do that. She ignored it. Therefore, she really cheated the pageant people. She precipitated the problem. 
not well, me. Okay, you made what you and if you saw the photographs as you did, yes, I did. I mean, there's no I question did. this girl I, I was saw not them. an innocent. I saw that, that that's true, and and uh, we've seen some of them, although we haven't shown them in their, their entirety. But um, however, you did not take those pictures yourself. You have taken pictures uh, of several of the uh, people who appear in Penthouse. Yes. We're just going to show a few of them now because time is really limited, but I'm just wondering, how do you select who you photograph? Well, I don't... It's a very difficult process to explain because it isn't something... I don't select a girl because she happens to be my type. I try to select a girl from the universal point of view. I try to place myself in the shoes of every man that looks at the magazine and find all those things which I feel are going to appeal to them. Because if I chose only the girls that appeal to me, I'd have a very small readership. <laughs> what kind of a girl does appeal to Bob Gucci? Well, I like girls who are very cerebral. I like girls that are svelte. I don't necessarily like big busted women. Um, I like girls rather like Kathy Keaton. You know, she's. She's really my type. And uh, when Kathy first, when she first came to work for me, she fully expected me to photograph her for Penthouse, and I refused. She said, but I'm this, and I'm a well-known dancer, and I'm, you know, she was a celebrated beauty in London at that time. And I said, yeah, but you're not right for the magazines. So you see, I didn't use it. <laughs> Have she you was ever, my type. Has she ever been in the magazine? She appeared in the magazine when we did shots of a show that she was in, but she was just part of, a, of a, a whole show that we had photographed. Uh -huh. There was no concentration on her at all. And she had all her clothes on? No, she had most of her clothes on, yes. She was <gasps> dressed, she had pasties and, and uh, a little okay. outfit. Uh -huh. But she wasn't nude. Wow, uh, you also uh, photographed Pia Zidore, uh, who actually is the person who interviewed us. We also have some pictures mm -hmm. of her, which um, are very special. But. I just wanted you, we only have such a short time left, but all of this, this beautiful, magnificent house that we're in. Short time ago, you were told that you had a malignant brain tumor. Not a brain tumor. No, 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 no. but um, oh, you I didn't have a brain tumor. I had what? a tumor on my scalp okay. in here. And it was malignant? It was malignant, yes. Okay, that must have been terrifying. I had it removed. Well, it was, I guess it was terrifying, yes, but... Um, I had it removed instantly, and I had to take a large piece of my scalp away and start transplanting hair from all. I moved my scalp around so it looked like a football, and it was it was lines running this way and this way. And this, but they f they filled it back in, uh, filled in the place that they they took it out. And it's gone completely. I went back every year for three years. The doctor examined it very very carefully, and he said there's no trace of the cancer. It's gone. Wow. And how are you feeling today? So I, I knock on wood. <gasps> okay. And I, Bless and God for looking after me. Well, okay, obviously healthy today. Listen, we have to close. I can't believe this. This went much too fast. We're here in your magnificent townhouse. All started because of Penthouse. Will you come back next week and, and share with us some more about Penthouse, sure some more about Bob Guccione? Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you. We're speaking with Bob Guccione. I hope that you enjoyed meeting him. I know that I certainly have, and I hope you'll join us again next week. Meantime, hope to see you then. Good night.